does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hartness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Judith Mills, and we talk about Agile and how it can be for everyone. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you visit workshops.work and download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy the show. Hello, Judith, and welcome to Hi. the show. Hi, Miriam. Good to be here. Yes, super excited to learn more about Agile. Absolutely. My favorite subject. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and before we get to, to Agile, and I'm very curious about your answer to this question is, when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? I knew you were going to ask me that because I heard you ask that so many times in other podcasts. <laughs> and here's my thought on it. I don't. I don't call myself a facilitator, mm. which is kind of interesting. I facilitate a lot. Actually, a fair proportion of my time is spent facilitating. But I don't call myself a facilitator. I'm still learning so much about facilitation. And I think there's a lot to learn about facilitation. And there are so many people that facilitate all sorts of things. And my practice is, a, is around Agile, which in my opinion, requires facilitation, which I think a lot of people don't realize. I don't know why I don't call myself a facilitator. <laughs> I think it's like, oh, that, oh no, I can't do that. But, you know, because I'm an engineer, but so it's not a label I've ever given myself, which is interesting. So what makes a facilitator in your, in yeah. your perspective and the difference between a facilitator and agile coach? So in my world at this point, I've, I think of a facilitator as someone who could go into these group sessions and uh, things like, like really big subjects, you know, like race and religion and, you know, important things <laughs> and facilitate an outcome for a huge group and that they can, you know, they're, they're working with this myriad of topics on really important subjects. And, you know, I stand up agile teams in, <laughs> and work with companies and it's more contained that the topic is, you know, the topic's contained and the, the environment is uh, contained. So uh, I, I think that's maybe the difference in my mind. It's like I use it as a tool. It's a very important tool for what I'm doing. And it's important to get the outcomes I get. But it's not my reason for going in. It's not my reason for being engaged. Mm. So how did you get into Agile? And maybe, so you have a background in software engineering. That's so right. Maybe, maybe <laughs> the way into Agile is normal. But tell us more about your background and what Agile means to you. So my first Agile experience was when I was uh, going to China, I worked for, a, I was actually independent and I was working with a team in China to on some manufacturing software. And they asked me to go there and they said, hey, we want you to deliver at this project with Agile. I said, what's Agile? They said, uh, we want you to deliver something every two weeks. I said, oh, okay, we'll deliver something every two weeks, <laughs> which I, you know, That's what they told me Agile was, but it absolutely, yes, okay, that's a part of Agile. But uh, I soon learned that there was more to it than that. And so there's a gentleman at the, at the uh, company who was actually very trained, already knew Agile was using Scrum. And he took me under his wing and, and told me all the stuff I was doing that wasn't quite right. And then there's, a, there's actually a, a Dutch author, I can't think of his name, he wrote I think he's Dutch. He wrote Scrum and XP from the Trenches, mm -hmm. which is a, a book I recommend to everyone. And I recommend, I read his book and it really sort of made me realize, oh, this is something that is, this is really cool. And this is something that we could do. And so we started using it. I made a lot of mistakes and <laughs> many mistakes and uh, learned that it's interesting because Agile then is about people and collaboration and communication and and that's then what led me into facilitation because I realized how important some of the meetings are, were especially the retrospectives and getting people to speak and say what they thought the story sizes were and 
be comfortable sharing with each other things that have gone wrong. And I started to look around for facilitation. So on another trip over to China, and I found before I left, I was told about Michael Wilkinson's book, The Secrets of Facilitation. Mm. And so I got that book and started reading. It's a very long plane journey to uh, Shanghai. (laughs) And I was reading it on the plane. And I read quite slowly. So I didn't get through a whole load of the book. But the pieces I did read, I was able to apply. And they made a huge difference in that visit, in the workshops that we ran. And so I was like, wow, this is really interesting. This stuff works. This this facilitation stuff's really cool. Can you give an example? Yeah, yeah. When in his book he talks about oh, when you break people up. So we were doing a drawing exercise, and his uh, recommendation was that when you break people, you break them into threes, and you give each person in the group a role. So you have the recorder, the timekeeper, and the reporter. Mm-hmm. Now everyone has skin in the game in in mm-hmm. your little breakout, right? Everyone has a job to do. Everyone has something. And, and so they engage differently. Mm-hmm. And so when we did this drawing, so they, they decided who was the timekeeper, keep them on track, make sure they finish their drawing, who was the recorder that was actually doing the drawing, and who was going to report on all the concepts and, and thoughts behind the drawing. And they did that, and it, I could you could just see the level of engagement and mm-hmm. and how well that went, right? So that was just one of them, but that's the one that stuck in my mind as being yeah. it, it, that I still use today. And I think it's so valid for every workshop that as soon as someone doesn't have a role, a job to do, then they will zone out immediately, right? Or yeah, they will exactly. disturb the meeting in some sort. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 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 it made them feel everyone knew they had a role, mm. right? So they weren't a bystander on the team. They had something that they had contributed to this picture that they had drawn. And yeah. they everyone wanted their picture taken with the picture that they had drawn. It was it was fun. <laughs> I still have those pictures. <laughs> oh, wonderful. And this is It shows how important it is to have this meaningful progress in a session. Okay, Mm. you have something that you can share afterwards and that you contributed to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was fun. And that came from his book. And there's there's so much in there. And, you know, I love to hear him talk. He he actually has a school here, a facilitation school here in Atlanta. Mm. So we're lucky enough to have him come and, and talk to our group now and again. So that's good. Nice. So now looking back to your first visit to China, what is in a nutshell the difference between delivering something every two weeks and being agile? (laughs) Well, let me see. There's so much to that question. You can deliver something every two weeks and maybe it's not meaningful. So I could deliver requirements in two weeks Mm -hmm. or I could deliver a design in two weeks or I could deliver. But if I'm actually building software. Now, even then, if I'm building software, then I can deliver a maintenance program in two weeks. Easy. I can deliver a menu in two weeks. Nothing, right? (laughs) So looking at your project and saying, and this is where I think one of your, your, your topics is, where does it go wrong? Here's where it goes wrong, some part of where it goes wrong. If I'm looking at my project and saying, What's the most difficult part of this project? So the example I give in in the world is if I'm building an uh, an ATM, a cash dispenser for a bank, Mm -hmm. what's the most important thing to build? So people tell me security because it's a bank and you want Mm -hmm. your money to be safe, right? You can't use it without security. Mm -hmm. And my answer is no, no. If it can't dispense money, if I can't go up to it and <laughs> take money. Not relevant, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't bother wasting time building security, mm. right? So you're looking at your project to say, without this, I don't have anything. Mm-hmm. So let me build that first. Let me show people. Now, if I build that first, then for the whole time, I'm, if I can't do it, A, I save money on security. Mm-hmm. If I can do it then the whole time I'm building the security part in order to bring it to market, I can be testing it. 
I can be showing it to people. I can be getting feedback on it. I can be, you know, doing all the stuff that will make it really robust and valuable when I do bring it to market. Mm. So there's two things. There's the getting people involved in giving you the feedback and feeling part of what you're building and really a, a sense of ownership in what you're building. Mm -hmm. But there's also the aspect of baking in the testing because you're, you bring it, you're showing it, you're showing it. And so you're, you're always verifying that this is what you want. This is what you want. And you basically avoid getting married to your ideas too early. Right? Absolutely. Yes. Because, you know, you could show something and somebody says, oh, I want that to be like this instead of like that. And when that happens in two weeks, you've got less bill so you can make changes because it's you're changing something you wrote two weeks ago versus now you ask me for a change from something I wrote six months ago. That's like going to take me forever. and It's going to be really hard. And there's all this other stuff I've written on top of it. Whereas if I'm showing you now and you're making a change now, I'm, I'm only changing two weeks worth of work. Mm. And this makes me wonder about two things. One is to what extent can we apply agile to non-software development teams? And can we then have only part of the team or part of the company working agile? Because this means actually that you need to have everyone involved in these two week sprints. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes and, and yes, you can absolutely use it outside of software. We have done implementations for implementation comp groups. We've done it for contract and negotiators. We've done it for all sorts because it's really about breaking down the work into manageable chunks, verifying it as you go and visualizing where you are in the process. So you can do that for anything. We do that for gardening. <laughs> we I want do it. to know more about that one. <laughs> so I, I really do think you can use it for all sorts. For I've seen on YouTube where people have used it to get their children to go to bed on a Sunday evening so that they can be up for school in the morning. All the, you know, all sorts of things. So you can you can apply it everywhere. And then can you apply it to companies when everyone's not agile? Yes, you can. I think it has an impact and then people start looking and saying, what is this? How are you doing that? And slowly things do tend to fall into a rhythm. But, you know, it's better if you've got participation, but if you haven't, it's not going to stop you mm -hmm. from deciding how to build your, your projects, how to deliver your projects. Because I... I can imagine that in a company that is usually work used to the normal general waterfall project management, mm -hmm. they have their timelines, they have the expectations of delivery. Mm -hmm. And if I understand the agile framework correctly, then if you work in sprints of two weeks, mm -hmm. it makes it so difficult to actually provide these very specific timelines. Ah, that's because we haven't had a discussion about this last week. That's because people merge in maintenance with new work and if you do that you're in a world of hurt because maintenance bugs if you like that come in from outside is unplanned work and unplanned work will always consume all of the time available if you let it mm -hmm. so you have to protect the teams from the unplanned work so one of the big mistakes is saying okay we want to work on this new work and now we've got all this unplanned work that's swirling around. And that's where people get wrapped up. What I encourage people to do is separate those two things mm -hmm. and have either a team or designated people go off the team and do the unplanned work. That's their job for that two weeks, not working on the new stuff. And then you, that constrains the unplanned work to that one person or that team of people that you've put on it because they're responsible. Now, they still have access to the other people, but they're doing the unplanned work, allowing the, the teams the freedom to do the new work, the planned work, the projects that are going to take you forward and bring value. Which then relates back to what we mentioned earlier, to having very specific roles 
Yes, what yes. What everyone is doing, right? There you go. And so they're the guardians, if you will, the protectors of the team to allow the team to get into focus. Now, when you do that, to bring that back to your question, when you do that, a team will tend to fall into a rhythm of what we call velocity, mm -hmm. where they're saying, okay, we can get through this amount of work, this volume of work over a two week stretch. So, and you'll find they'll have a minimum, a maximum and an average. So mm -hmm. if everything goes really, really well and everyone's in top form, then you'll have a certain velocity, a certain number, say 45, something like that. And then if someone gets sick or people have to take time off or whatever that velocity will drop and maybe you'll have a minimum velocity, say 30. So somewhere in the middle, you'll have an average. And then you can use that to predict what work that team will get through. And then that's how you do your project management. So you say, okay, we've got this volume of work. We look at that and say, okay, what, how, what does that represent? Based on this team's velocity, we think they'll get through this much of this project. And now you prioritize everything such that you do the most important stuff first mm -hmm. and the nice to have at the end. And now you're going to have a result. Two questions. How do you come <laughs> up with these numbers? Why isn't it 42? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And yes. How do you know what is the most important thing? To do. Yeah. How do you know that it's about getting the cash out instead of security? Because it might depend on the perspective of the person. How yeah. do you agree on something like that in a team? Well, and that's where, of course, facilitation comes in, right? So now yeah. we've got to facilitate it. Yay. <laughs> so, so you have to have those discussions around about how to prioritize it because engineers are going to want to prioritize it around their productivity, right? If I go in this code, I want to go in it one time and do all these six things, right? Whereas you're like, oh, no, we want you to bring this one thing to the marketplace. And so it's a very creative process to decide what is the most high, you know, the highest priority thing. And it, it does involve um, collaboration with the business, with the engineers, with the product owner. So that's your collabor that's your collaboration, your facilitation, your getting the voices heard. But then, you know, the role of the product owner is the final voice. They have, so it's, it's, it can be a very dem democratic process, but there's one final person that's saying, right, this is how we're going to go forward. Now we've got all the information uh, fed into the system. And what about these points? <laughs> oh, and the points. <laughs> so the points, so the points are just to have a measurement because you can't, no without an, a number, right? That's what, how we do it. But we, we size the stories and we can size them. I've sized them in silence, with, which is not the right recommended way to do it, but I have with no, no numbers at all. So you're saying, is, do we understand this piece of work? So we understand what it is. And now we look at it and we say, okay, I understand that. So therefore, it's it's a certain amount of effort to get that all the way to done through testing, design, everything for that piece of work. Now I look at the next piece of work and I say, is this about the same amount of effort or is it more or is it less? Mm -hmm. And so you 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 look at everything relative, all the stories in that in that uh, project relative to each other. And now you can see which ones are the big ones, which ones are the medium ones, and which ones are the very easy little ones. And once you've grouped them like that, so it's a big grouping process, which, of course, facilitators love grouping processes. So you do your grouping, and then you can say, okay, well, all these large ones, we're going to give them a number, say eight, and these medium ones, we're going to give a five, and these small ones, we'll give a three. And that now you've got your numbers. So that and that's all it is. It's not related to days. It's not related to hours. It's relative, you know, complexity. Okay. And then you would say, or you learn by doing how many of these points you can fit yeah. into a two weeks. Sprint. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't sweat it because. Because it'll just come out because some of the eights maybe should have been fives and some of the fives maybe should have been eights and by, you know, and, and fives might have been threes and threes might have been fives. So you just go with what you've got. Now, if you learn something which we'll, we're always learning while we're doing a project, where new information is always surfacing. So if we learn something that informs our sizing that it was wrong 
dramatically, then we revisit it. Mm -hmm. But if it just took us longer than we thought, we, yeah, it is what it is. Okay. And I, I came across this concept that I find fascinating of poker. Oh, planning poker. Yes, so that every team, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understood is that everyone in the team gives their complexity points yeah. and then discuss if they're really different from each other. They discuss why they gave this different complexity and thereby the team really aligns and sees the different perspectives. Absolutely. And the, the whole point of that, and it works really well with mature teams, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion, Because, yes, you can see that maybe the test engineer says, oh, this is a eight, and one of the software engineers says it's a three. Well, it might be really, it might be one line of code to program and create 20 test cases. So you get that conversation. You get that uh, collaboration around the different roles and the different piece aspects of the work that needs to get done. So it has huge, tremendous value. Interestingly because it is very numeric, a lot of teams will tie those to hours. Mm -hmm. And then you, you also run the risk, unless you play it properly, where you place your card on the table and then everyone turns it at the same time, of people looking to see what other people have played and then they play the same thing because they want to play it safe. And so if the team is well facilitated and feels safe, and you have that safety, it can work really, really well to play planning poker. But it's just one way of sizing stories. People think it's the only way, but it's not. And there are two things that um, catch my curiosity. One is, it sounds as if putting time next to it is a kind of trap. And yeah. how can you avoid that? Because I think that this means a mindset shift to yeah. go from time into complexity, which for a random person like me might sound like exactly the same. Uh -huh. And the other one is, how do you create then the safety? What is it? What does it take to have the uh -huh. for the conversation you just referred to? Okay. So why is time a trap? Let me talk about that. And then we'll come back to safety. So time is a trap because if you do it over here, we use Instacart. I don't know if you use Instacart, but Instacart always, so it's an online shopping. So you order your groceries and then your little shopper goes off to the shop and buys your grocery for you and brings them to the house. Mm -hmm. And Instacart always says on you, we've just saved you, you know, three hours of shopping time or whatever it is. No, they haven't really. I mean, they're <laughs> because they're talking about the shopping, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I had to go online. I had to choose what it was. Well, I still did all that. The shopper never and especially with vegetarians, trust me, ever is able to find everything you want. And so they text you constantly. I can't find this. I can't find that. I can't find the other. So now you're in this dialogue with your shopper and then they come to the house and you have to pack your groceries. You have to put them away. You have to. So what are they actually measuring? They're measuring the time in the store. Mm. And it's the same with software. If you say that's going to take me two hours, It's not. You've got all the other stuff that goes with it, right? You've got all the other things that you're doing that get you to that two hours and then wrap up after you've spent the two hours. So most engineers, people think engineers pad. We don't. We think we're so much smarter than we are. We always think we'll get stuff done so much faster than we do. And so when you start thinking about hours, you're going to be wrong. Mm. So it's about setting expectations? Yeah, because you want to be able to deliver. And if you're tracking to hours, you won't. Because look at the interruptions you have in a day. Yeah. And every time you get interrupted, it takes you 20 minutes to get back into flow. Yeah. So every interruption, you lose 20 minutes. And I think it also channels the conversation to a level where you can really talk about what needs to be done and the potential obstacles along the way instead of someone needs to work faster right 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 and, mental, actually yes and we're in a thinking age right mm. and so one of the things i say to try and help people is okay i have my best ideas when i sleep 
Mm-hmm. And so if I wake up in the morning and I'm cleaning my teeth and I'm like, oh, I know how to solve this problem. I can't wait to get to my desk and, and code this out. Should I bill eight hours sleep to that job? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? Very good because yeah. because, exactly. because our brains don't stop, right? But they're solving the, the puzzles while we eat, while we sleep, while we... So it's not, we're not in an industrial age anymore. Yeah. where we're stamping out widgets, right? Yeah. Hi, this is Andrew. I'm a facilitator and head of customer success at Session Lab, the dynamic workshop planner tool. More than 30,000 facilitators, trainers and coaches use our workshop planner tool and save time and effort in the design process. So how do they do it? Our drag and drop agenda builder makes it easy to transform your ideas into high quality workshops and the timing of your agenda automatically updates when you make changes. You can collaborate in real time with your colleagues and easily share professional-looking printouts with your clients. And if you need inspiration, you can check out our library of more than 500 activities and exercises and simply drag the ones you need right into your workshop agenda. So check out Session Lab to save time and effort in your workshop design process. And now get your first two months of Session Lab Pro absolutely free at sessionlab.com forward slash workshops work. And we want to come back to safety. Uh-huh. And then I'm, I have another question. So <laughs> safety. <laughs> I'm intrigued. So I think with the safety, it's about... Uh, not losing face, especially as an engineer. If you, one of the interesting things about engineers is a lot of times the engineers in the room have been the top of their class throughout schooling. They've gone to university. They've done well. Now they've wound up in this job and now they're with peers mm-hmm. who are just as smart as they are. And that's kind of scary when you've been at the top of your of your class the, all, all your life up until that point. And so you don't want to look like you don't know what you're talking about or ask the dumb questions or, uh, you know, not be able to contribute to a solution. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things as a facilitator that I do, people know I'm an engineer. And so I ask the dumbest questions. Mm. So that if it's like, what? She asked me that? And I'll just say, you know, well, I don't know this. Or, and then people will be like, oh, well, if she's, you know, she's in, in front of the room and she's saying she doesn't know. So it's, it, there's the modeling aspect of it that says mm-hmm. it's okay to be vulnerable and to not know the answer. And that's quite important. And then when people do say things, taking them seriously and, and digging into what they're bringing up and seeing the value in it so that every voice has value. And I think that's the the meta skill, if you will, of a facilitator, right, is that that curiosity, that being intrigued by what's being said and what's happening in the room and not taking having to solve for the problem yourself. Yeah. How easy or difficult is it then for the team to adjust to this? Because I can imagine, okay, you're modeling it and then some will feel this comfort of I can ask all the questions and others might just start rolling their eyes or just out of habit saying, oh, yes, (laughs) we have to discuss this now. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) You always get that. And I think you always will. It's human nature, right? Mm. And so with some people, it's just like, they're with me. You know, we'll get there. This will be better. But then you get some people who think that I don't need to collaborate. I know the answer. I'm, you know, I'm going to be able to solve this. It's interesting how that comes around, though. I'll tell you, I was having a discussion with a group and I was saying to them, you know, I want you to bring your whole self to this. It's really important. You, you got to bring your creativity as well as your know-how. And this one gentleman, he was an older gentleman. He said to me, Judith, you don't understand. He says, we're here. We're getting ready to retire. We're working on this old code. We don't, we're not interested in bringing our whole selves. We just want to get the job done. And I was like, okay then. (laughs) So I said, well, you know, if you feel like this is a complete waste of your time, then I think you need to feel free to 
go back to your desk if you want to and work. But, you know, we've got these other things that we're doing. I walked him through where we were going, what the outcome was going to be. And he stayed. So he stayed. But he was, you know, clear that this was not for him. Two years later, I get a call from this guy. He's left where he was working, where my, the client I was working with. He's now with a new company. And he says, we need you here. We need you to bring all that crazy stuff you brought there to here. Because <laughs> this is awful. Yes. Because when he was in it, he didn't realize how freeing it was and how rewarding it was to work mm-hmm. a different way. You know, I, I once did a presentation for about 200 people explaining to them how we were going to go to Agile, how we were going to roll out Scrum. It must have been 200 people in the room, mostly developers. And at the end of the presentation, this one voice just looked me right in the eye and said, that's not going to work here. Uh, so I, was, I looked at him and I tilted my head and I said, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. Why? Tell me why. And with it, I picked up the pen and did the total facilitation thing and just wrote on every surface in the room that was wipeable Mm -hmm. all the reasons he said. And then other people would say. And all the things they said, I wrote it all up so it could all be seen. Mm -hmm. and Everyone could see why it wasn't going to work. And then I said, wow, that's a lot of reasons why this can't work. What if it could? Mm -hmm. And then they started like murmuring and saying stuff. And I said, what if, what if this wasn't real? What if we could change this? What if we could change this other thing you've told us about? I went through all the reasons it couldn't work and, and queried them. Why does it have to be this way? And I didn't answer anything in that session, but I got them thinking. Mm-hmm. And that, that group went full tilt agile. I mean, they did amazing work. And this guy challenged me every step of the way, every step of the way. And now he's a real agile advocate. So Wonderful. And if you could boil it down to the maybe one to two, three things that had to change first. So if approaching this challenge in an agile way would mean, okay, what is the most important thing that needs to change first? <laughs> <laughs> then roll it out, right? Yes. What are the complexity points to that? Absolutely. And for this particular one, it was about the leadership and the way they had been taught to lead mm-hmm. and the things they had been taught to measure and the roles they thought they had and changing that. So we spent probably a month or two months in this, I can only call it a closet, <laughs> six of us with no windows and uh, <laughs> it, it only had a whiteboard because I demanded a whiteboard <laughs> and we worked literally on that on you know what is your role if it's not uh, assigning work mm. because that's a scary thing for managers they think they have to assign all the work well, if you didn't have to assign all the work what would you do And the, the most rewarding thing that came from that, we, we spent a lot of time with the managers. One day, this, one of the managers, he never spoke unless I asked him directly mm-hmm. because he was very introverted, very, very smart, but totally introverted. But if I asked him, he always had good ideas. And so, so you had to invite him to participate. You know, and this is another thing we learn from facilitation, right? That you hear every voice. So you make check in with people. And uh, this day he, he showed up to work and he looked at me and he says, uh, I realized this morning when I was driving into work that life is different. So I looked at him. He said, I used to drive to work with the weight of the world on my shoulders, that mm. clench in the wheel, that if things go badly today, it's on me. He wow. said, and today I drove to work knowing I'm part of a team. Wow. I almost cried. Yeah. What a relief for this guy to have that experience. And I wonder whether, I love the example, and I wonder whether this aim to distribute work, allocate work as managers, is related to something like the illusion of control 
Oh, yes. <laughs> or is it the anxiety of thinking? Because I have the impression that also many managers actually enjoy spending their time in meetings because it gives them the perfect excuse not to do the thinking work, the complex <laughs> Like that. You're not attributed <laughs> time measure to. You might be onto something. <laughs> I think, yes, it is a, a control thing, right? Because managers tend to think that if they assign it, they're going to assign it to the right person. Mm. Right? And the right person will do the job and it'll be done efficiently. Mm. When in reality, what they do is they create single points of failure. So now this one person that you always assign that certain type of work to is the only person that can do that type of work. And now if that person leaves or gets fed up of doing that type of work and doesn't want to do it anymore, you say, no, you have to stay and keep doing this kind of work. Guess what? They have two feet. They can look and get another job and that, or they can retire or they can whatever, mm -hmm. right? And now where are you? Now you're not efficient anymore. You've got no one that can do that type of work. And it's a weird way of thinking, but so many companies think this way. And what would then be the alternative to assign it to the team or to let the team come up with what piece of work needs to be done in the first place? Absolutely. So if you've got three people on the team and you've got a list, a prioritized list, Mm -hmm. Then if I free up, I go to the prioritized list and I pick off from the top down what I can do, which is the next thing that's on high in the priorities that I can do. And see, it takes away then that whole, you've got your work and I've got my work. And so if you get sick, I'm not going to do your work because I've got my own work to do. Even if your work's higher priority than my work, I'm still going to do my work because it's mine. And, and my sense of, of uh, responsibility and my sense of value is wrapped up in what I am bringing. And so I'm going to complete my work rather than the team. Mm. And so this, this new way of thinking or working then creates a shared responsibility for a task or a project or a sprint. Absolutely. And also then shared knowledge. Mm. shared ownership, shared value. How would you then deal with a team member who, and there are those around, who is just trying to avoid trying to shuffle the work on someone else's plate and then leave early? <laughs> <laughs> Miriam, that's, that's, <laughs> they get voted off the island pretty quickly. <laughs> the, the team won't, doesn't typically put up with that. And they'll be, they'll start saying, we would like this person removed from our team or, you know, or the, else they, their peer pressure mm -hmm. sets up and you find that it either corrects or you, or that person gets removed. Which then asks for a total different level of safety and yes. trust. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they're going to, the peer to peer, in your retrospectives, because the point of a retrospective is to say what happened last week, what's the last two weeks, what's, what can we do differently in the next two weeks? And so if you've got someone on the team who is not contributing, then, you know, that should come out by not necessarily calling that person directly, but talking about the work that got done and why work didn't get done and, and how the work could be done as you go forward. Because Why would someone do that? They either they're not invested in the process, the product or the team. Mm -hmm. So how does that change? How do you get that person to to feel a sense of motivation, right? Mm -hmm. They want to be they, they need autonomy, mastery and purpose for motivation, which is intrinsic. So do they have those things? That's where I would look first. Do they have mastery? Uh, can they do the work? Or are they doing this because they really don't have the skill set to do the work? Do they understand the purpose, the value of what you're building and why you're building it? Why is that important? Why is it important to the company and thus their ability to get paid? Mm -hmm. And then autonomy. Are they Have they got autonomy? Uh, are they able to You know, do the work in the way that they want to get to work. And do they have all the information, all the tools, materials right. whatsoever in order to do the work? 
Absolutely. Mm, and then again, in the retrospective, then it doesn't become a topic around a person, but around the necessities in order to fulfill this task. To get the work done. Yeah, exactly right. And I think that's, you know, retrospectives are an area that is so needed, so needs facilitation, good facilitation. And so for scrum masters, I think, who whose role is to, to help the team and to break down any barriers for the team and frequently are requested to run retrospectives, facilitation skills are an absolute must. But, and, you know, another thing that happens in, in Agile is people stop doing retrospectives and that they just stop because they're boring, right? And so here's the thing. They're done every two weeks mm -hmm. and the starter kit, if you like, I call it a starter kit. If you look in scrum books, you read any scrum books is what went well, what mm -hmm. went badly, Uh, what should we do differently? Mm -hmm. Three questions. Yeah. Well, if you've been doing that now for two years, it is boring, isn't it? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You want to think more creatively about what do we want to get out of this retrospective? Did we have a good sprint? In which case, hey, what did we do well? And how do we keep doing that? Mm. Right? Yeah. If we had a bad sprint, why was it bad? And how can we fix it? I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. And so thinking about the outcome of the retrospective rather than just going with those three questions over and every two weeks, it's um, I've had retrospectives on, we go to too many meetings. So we let's do, talk about it in the retrospect. So we put up all the meetings on the whiteboard, all the different meetings that everyone goes to, and then we culled them. And then we talked about, you know, having trusted relationships where one person from the team goes to a meeting and reports back to the others, mm -hmm. the, you know, the highlights of the meeting rather than all five people going to that meeting. And then how could we reduce it? We, and we, I think we, I don't know how many hours we got that team back from meetings that were, they were going to, that they didn't need to go to. Wow. And let me dig just a little bit deeper into how to, make a retrospective more non-boring <laughs> or yes. more interesting because I think it's it might not only apply to the retrospective but to any recurring meetings. Yes, exactly. Yes. I think people get into habits. Even mm -hmm. with us, we have a meeting that we have with a, a group of leaders and we did went to two-day meeting and we do it once a quarter. And we did the meeting. And then the second one, I usually talk to the sponsor about what does he want to achieve in the meeting? And uh, he said, oh, I just want, the last one was great. I just want the same thing. <laughs> I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, because then it won't be great, <laughs> right? So people hit on a, a recipe that works for them and then they just keep using it. And sure enough, it just gets old and stale. So One of my favorite questions to people when I'm trying to design a meeting or a, a workshop or, or a facilitated event is when you're driving home this evening and you're waiting to tell your significant other, your family, you had a great meeting today. It was fabulous because what? Exactly. Tell me why. And, mm -hmm. and then I... I listen to very carefully to what it is they have to say in their answer to that. And it's funny because I usually in all my onboarding calls for a facilitated event, I ask the question, but differently, I ask them, imagine you're driving home, <laughs> you're talking to your significant other and you say, what a waste of time. Oh, <laughs> what must have happened to consider this day, this workshop of meeting a waste of time because you learn so much about what has been going wrong before and then it's yeah. easy to just avoid those. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm going to steal that. Very good. <laughs> okay. According to you, what makes a workshop fail? Lack of planning mm -hmm. and, and lack of subject knowledge of the facilitator. So if I'm confident and I know my material and I've planned, then things can go wrong and I can go with it. I can figure out what to do next. I can punt. I can change course. I can 
if something's not working, I can pull it out and put something else in its place that'll be just as valuable, but just different. If I'm running out of time, I can swap out a long exercise for a shorter one and still achieve the same outcome. So it's that ability to be able to do that. If you can't and you're just following a cookie cutter program that someone else is, and then I think you're at higher chance that you'll fail. If you get a difficult person or an event that was unexpected happen in your workshop. I think having also, though, I hate when you have prisoners, right? So prisoners, yes. So there's a, I can't remember where it came from. I think it was, so, oh, before we finish, Diana Larson and and Esther Darby have written a fabulous book on retrospectives, Mm -hmm. highly recommended, which has a bunch of exercise in, is in in the show notes which keep them interesting. So that's good. So prisoners. So I think it was in, because it was in their book. That's right. Because I think it's in their book. They say there are adventurers who come to a meeting like, oh, what am I going to find out? What am I going to discover? What's what's going on here? And those are you, those are your best attendees, right? Then you have your shoppers who come to your meeting and like, oh, I might, I might see something I like, I might not, you know, we'll see what happens here, I might take something away. Hmm. Then you've got your prisoners who are like, I do not want to be here. Uh, this is, you know, why did my boss make me? Mm-hmm. And then you've got your uh, vacationers who are just happy to be away from their desk, <laughs> do anything other than the work that needs to be done at my desk. If you think of those four people, if you've got a room full of prisoners, then you're, you're, it's going to be a heavy lift to get that. Uh, so they've come to the workshop. They don't know why they're there. They don't know what the, you know, they were just sent there by someone and they don't want to be there. So I had that one time, this very big guy, he's, he had tattoos, he was big. And we were doing a disc uh, workshop with um, communication styles. And I went around the room asking people, you know, what did they want to get out of the workshop? And he, I think he was the first one. And he said, uh, nothing. I don't even want to be here. Mm. How, did you <laughs> him? How did you onboard him? What was I, I, Well, I said, you know, I, well, I'm really sorry to hear that and really glad you shared it with me. So let's see if, if you still feel that way at lunchtime. Mm. And if you do, we'll check in. But I, I'm hoping that we can turn that around. Yeah. So I said, just give it a chance till lunchtime and let's check in then. Do you have a silver bullet exercise that you would get out of your toolbox when you have the impression you have a room full of prisoners? Oh, one of my favorites is another um, Michael Wilkinson one, which is uh, two gifts and a, I can't think of the word he uses, but basically it's like two things I'm bringing and they could be anything. So I, I don't, whatever they need to bring. And then one thing I need. Mm. And the things so, can be intangible. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I could be bringing, you know, anger mm-hmm. and, you know, resentment. But and I need whatever it is you need. A cup of coffee. I don't know, some, a cup of coffee would be a bad one. But I need to understand why I'm even in here. Mm-hmm. Right. So now they've expressed when you do that, you're giving people the outlet to express how they feel and what's behind them being prisoners and you've got a list of what they need and if you can now address some of their needs mm-hmm. like how long is this going to last or what's the purpose of this because a lot of times people get sent to stuff they don't see the connection between what they're doing and what it is your workshop is about mm-hmm. and so if you can make that connection for them then they're going to settle down and so it's making that connection early in the session that says Uh, why they're here, why it's important for them, how it's going to impact their future. So, you know, one of the tricks is to use you seven times in the first five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. You're here because you're really important to what this process and how and the outcome of it. So you need to understand what's expected of you so that when you go back to your desk, you're able to hit the ground running, right? So now it's all about them. It's all about you. I love that. Yeah. Wonderful. And in the beginning, and I cannot imagine that time is running so fast, but (laughs) quite early in our conversation, you mentioned that you could even apply agile to gardening. (laughs) (laughs) And I would think, so I'm very curious to hear more about that. 
also because at one point when I heard you speaking and explaining the core of Agile, I thought that it's a perfect method that we could even apply to ourselves. Absolutely. We run our business using a Kanban board and because there's more than one person, whenever there's, even if there's only one person for sure, but certainly when there's more than one. So I'll give you the gardening, a gardening exercise. We use it in the gardening all the time. In fact, I was told um, over Thanksgiving, we were spending some time out in the garden and I was told no Kanban board. I was like, whoa, how, how do I even do this without a Kanban board? But so, you know, I'll give you one example, which is we were going on vacation and we needed to make sure that the plants were going to get enough water. Mm -hmm. So we had to finish this irrigation system. But there was also a bunch of other things that needed doing before we went on vacation. So we're on our last day before we leave for vacation. We can't the last day we could possibly be in the garden before the vacation. And now we've got all these things to do. So and there's two of us. So I put up a big white sheet and then added all the piece, all the things that we needed to get done needed were put onto the sheet. So this is all the, the, the list of things that needs to get done. Now we can prioritize it, right? We can't go on vacation unless the plants get water. Well, we could go on vacation, but all the plants would be dead when we came home. Let's face it. So that was a must have. So that went to the top. So let's do that first. But it's, As much about the sorting of the work that needed to get done, it was having the communication, getting on the same page. What is the most important? Well, I think we need to do this. No, well, I, I think we need to do this other thing instead, and here's why. Right? I think we need to pot on the tomatoes or whatever. Oh, well, you know, well, the tomatoes can survive for a week as long as we leave them in water. But if we don't do this, then that plant's going to die. So mm -hmm. these conversations that's getting out of what's in your head that makes perfect sense to you. Why wouldn't it make sense to the other person to actually have the conversation together and hear what each other have to say really informs then what gets done. And the other thing then is, We need to do the irrigation system together, but after that was a bunch of tasks that either one could do, right? Anyone could have done it. So now, because we're moving these tasks as we start them, I'm in the front garden. I come around. I think I'm going to do the compost. Oh, the compost is already getting done. Right. Okay. So then I'll do this next thing. And you're not both you know, trying to work on the same thing or getting in each other's way. So, and things are, are moving along. And then one of the best things is the end of the day, sun's gone down, you have to leave the garden and you look at your sheet of paper and go, wow, look at what we got done. Look at all that stuff we got done today. And this relates perfectly again to what you said in the beginning that Agile is less about the method, but more about the communication and the people around it to yes. actually clarify. So what I hear is that Agile is more of a way of working and thinking, of prioritizing, than it is about the sprints and the right. product manager and teams. And I think that's the issue, right? It's because Kanban to some extent, but Scrum for sure, is pretty prescribed in that it's time boxed. It has a sequence of events. It has a sprint planning. It has a daily stand-up. It has a retrospective. It has a sprint review. It has these ceremonies mm -hmm. and this method of working. And it, a lot of it's been codified around what does a story look like? What does sizing look like? What is velocity? That people think it's a process. Mm. not a mindset mm. and you can do a process and not get a good result as you pointed out in the first story it's delivering something every two weeks doesn't mean it's valuable what you're delivering you're just delivering something so it's that change of mindset that is the beauty of agile and unfortunately some companies don't ever make that mindset shift they're so focused on the process and the the process can still be broken you can have a list that's not prioritized you can have a list that's not prioritized that has people assigned in which case you're not a team you're a group of people working on the same project because to be a team you really need a big hairy audacious goal something bigger than you 
mm -hmm. without the support of the other people, you can't achieve. So, yeah, so there's no reason to be in a team because I've got my assigned work, you've got your assigned work. And so you're not getting the, you know, what the what facilitation is all about, right? Bringing all those ideas and those thoughts and those, all that creativity and turning it into something so much more mm -hmm. than the original plan or the, or one person or. Which then also brings the shared responsibility and the higher purpose to each of the team yeah. members. Which in my opinion then is why it's higher quality, better product, more inclusive and a much more fun way to work. So dear listeners, give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> If someone in the audience now thinks, oh, actually, I want to try that out for myself. Mm -hmm. What would be the natural approach to just give it a try? Absolutely. Make work visible. Make the work visible. So if you are going to do Kanban, it's easiest because you're just exposing your existing process. And you can do that by just saying, okay, what are the things I want to get done? And put them in a column. Create three columns. What do I want to get done? What am I actively working on? And what have I done? Mm. So I'm actively working on it. So when you're running a workshop, for example, I had a, I can't think of the name of the process right now. It's an agile movement that's spun up. LS, what's it standing for? Liberating structures. Yes, liberating structures. Thank you. So I went to a liberating structures workshop and they had put the agenda across the board using Kanban. Mm. So they had, here's the agenda. And each thing that we started working on, they moved that into this is the liberating structure that we're currently working on and mm. moved it into the center. So we all knew, okay, this is whichever exercise it was. And so then when we finished it and we'd all practiced it and we'd had a go at it, they moved it to done. Mm. Is, is everyone comfortable that you know this exercise now? Yes. So let's try the next exercise. And they would bring that over. And so that's literally it, right? They were using Kanban. And there was only ever one item in the doing column. Because mm -hmm. what you don't want is, you know, 20 items in the doing column, because you're not, you're only ever working on one thing at a time. And if something's stuck, then maybe you shouldn't have started working on that because it wasn't ready. And you should have had two pieces to that task. Mm -hmm. So for example, If I am requesting something off someone and so I write a ticket that says I'm going to, I don't know, change a membership. So I send the request and change membership is put into in progress. But really, that change membership required two things. Send the request and then pay the membership. So it should have been two tickets because then I could have put send the request. That's done. Mm -hmm. When the information comes back, now I can say pay for the subscription and then that gets done and this is so a I'm, fantastic productivity hack to break down every task in the smallest chunk of micro task absolutely mm -hmm. and it gives you this sense of achieving i love 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 moving my tickets on my board i have a mag magnetic board i have magnetic squares I don't have post-it notes anymore I have magnetic squares which are erasable mm -hmm. and I write on the square what the topic is and then I, I move it but I keep all the magnets with the writing on and the end of the week the beginning on Monday I look at all that stuff that got done erase it all off my little squares write new ones <laughs> and put them over on the other side of the It's board a sense of achievement of yeah yes because sometimes you just get bogged down in you know, all the stuff that needs to get done and you don't feel like you're making enough progress. And yeah. if you look back and you see all the progress you did make, it, it keeps you going for the yeah. other stuff. Motivating. Wonderful. Thank you for this little hack. Yes, so we can absolutely. all get to work. There you go. If someone fell asleep two minutes into our interview, just walk up and doesn't have time to listen to the hour. What would you like them to take away? I would like them to take away that agile techniques may be a process, maybe processes, but it's about people. And when you, when you want to tap into people, facilitation is essential. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and all these hacks with us, Judith. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. I could talk forever on this topic, as you can tell. Oh, I could <laughs> a million more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.